I'm Sarah Williamson, and this is Going Long with FCLT Global. On this show, you'll learn what it means to be long-term from the top minds in global business and investing. Leaders from companies and investment organizations join us to discuss how they are leading their teams for the long run on issues including capital allocation, risk management, climate change, and sustainability. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org. Henry Fernandez is MSCI's Chairman and Chief Executive Officer and has led the firm for over two decades. Prior to MSCI, Henry was a Managing Director at Morgan Stanley. He also founded Furco Partners, Inc., a private equity investment firm in Mexico. In 2019, Henry was one of the 30 CEOs named in Barron's list of the world's best CEOs. And importantly for us, Henry has been part of the FCLT journey since the very beginning. So thank you so much for um, joining me for the podcast today. Well, it's a pleasure to be here with you, Sarah, and obviously being a a member of the FCLT initiative and how great things uh, you are doing uh, to help progress the long-term investment horizon of, uh, of the world. Well, we appreciate that. And as you, as you well know, you know, our, our mission is to rebalance capital markets to support a long-term sustainable economy. And a big part of that um, sustainability is climate and what's happening um, with climate and the effects of climate change um, on the capital markets and on the pricing of assets. So maybe we can start there. Um, as you think about um, the pricing, the risk return of investment assets, um, as well as um, the access to capital, how do you think capital market participants can address climate risk as they're making um, these investment decisions? So first of all, I think we all uh, realize and recognize that uh, this is a, a climate change is an existential threat to our existence and, uh, and our next generation's existence. And, uh, and therefore the answer to, uh, to that threat is, is a uh, massive reconstruction of the entire global economy from reliance on, on uh, fossil fuels you know, to clean energy. And to do that in a relatively short period of time, which is a couple of decades, the last time something like this happened was, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, uh, that went uh, from an agricultural society to an industrial society. But even that one took 150 years to take effect. Uh, so we didn't have that gun to our head, you know, that pressure to achieve that. I believe that the answer to uh, to uh, the climate change uh, threat that we have will be solved simplistically, but uh, importantly, by two, uh, two big areas, capital and energy. You know, the world runs on capital. Without capital, they, there are no investments. There is no uh, progress, economic progress uh, in society. And therefore, the role of capital is uh, very key. Uh, and obviously, the world runs on energy. And currently, most of it is fossil fuel energy, and then that, that needs to be replaced in a short period of time with, uh, with clean energy. So our role at MSCI, you know, like your role, uh, is, is in, the, in the capital part, you know, in, uh, in being able to understand what is the role of, of capital to solve this problem. And the role is huge because uh, the global investment industry is one of the most important industries in a society because it channels savings into productive investments for economic growth. So, uh, so what we're trying to do here uh, clearly is, is, uh, is re-channel uh, those savings and that capital into uh, places that are gonna uh, create uh, green, green technology, green infrastructure, clean energy, uh, and, and support those uh, companies, uh, private or public, or any other investment that is decarbonizing and helping solve the problem and withhold capital so, uh, or reduce capital to those that are carbonized in the world and are not you know, part of solving the, uh, the problem. So therefore, the actors in the capital markets, whether are the providers of capital, such as asset owners and their managers, the users of capital, such as public and private companies or governments for that matter, 
and the intermediaries of capital have to play a large role you know, in this transition and they have to play an immediate role um, and a fast role in order for us to, uh, to be able to, uh, to solve that problem. That will lead to a massive reallocation of capital, repricing of assets, whether it's financial assets or physical assets. It, it will therefore lead to a different risk and return profile for many investments. And for the, uh, the uh, users of capital, it will lead to uh, either access to or denial of access to capital and repricing of the cost of capital. Uh, the last point, Sarah, that I will make is that I used to think that even though we have say 20 years to solve this problem, maybe 30 years, that this reallocation of capital and repricing of assets will be a little more middle-ended or back-ended. Uh, we at MSCI have began to change our mind about that. We think that it will be front-ended. A lot of leading investors and, um, and leading you know, banks and intermediaries are beginning to act. And as you know, financial assets get priced at the margin. So if you have a number of leading investors repricing assets and reallocating assets, that transformation of the capital markets is gonna happen a lot faster than people believe it will. And therefore we're gonna start seeing a lot of that in the next few years, not in the next decade or two. I think it's one of the things that's so interesting about this challenge of adaptation to, to climate change is this time frame because as you've said it's we sort of a couple decades sounds like a long time it's actually not that long um, markets look forward um, but uh, and are trying to incorporate these changes now as as you think about how investors are incorporating um, either potential future pricing changes potential, um, government changes, uh, the, the sort of societal expectations around climate change. How, how, and obviously MSCI provides a lot of data for this. How do investors um, who can't, of course, foresee the future, how do they try to price these trends in now, which are pretty clear that they're happening, but we don't know exactly how long they'll take. Um, and we don't know exactly what shape or form they'll take. Well, Sarah, first of all, the, uh, based on our own models and our own uh, estimations, uh, the world is currently uh, very ill-prepared uh, at the moment you know, to solve uh, this problem. Um, there are a number of calls to, uh, to actions you know, in the world, uh, but we're still far from where we need to be to get this process uh, significantly on their way. So if you think about the MSCI All Country World Investable Index, which has about over 9,000 companies in 50 countries, uh, 98, 99% of market cap uh, of the world, it, that index of, of, of those uh, 9,000 plus companies, if you were to aggregate all of their carbon emissions, uh, a, or, or guesstimate a lot of those carbon emissions through models and the like, that's about 11 billion metric tons of, uh, of COE2 equivalent, uh, or about 22%, 21, 22% of the 52 billion metric tons that, uh, that the world emits. So uh, listed companies you know, represent 21%. So uh, the second thing is that at the current trajectories, uh, without any change to that trajectory, those companies are going to be uh, emitting 17 billion uh, metric, metric tons of uh, carbon dioxide equivalent by 2050, uh, or, uh, or about the equivalent of a world of 3.5 degrees Celsius warmer than it is today. So um, if we want to get all those listed companies to, uh, to stay uh, close to 2% degrees, Every company in that index will need to start reducing carbon emissions immediately by 8% per year, at least 8% per year uh, until 2050. So uh, that gives you a, a sense. Now, a couple other statistics to, uh, to sort of frame the discussion. About 80% of the companies in this index currently exceed the uh, emissions budget uh, that are needed to keep the world, the world below two degrees you know, by the end of the century. 
only about one third of the companies in this index have any kind of carbon emission reductions targets of any kind. And only 15% of the total companies have any kind of net zero carbon emission targets. So that tells you that yes, there is a little bit of progress, but we're far from that. So this problem clearly is a problem of disclosure you know, by companies. Uh, it, it's a, a problem of uh, data, you know, not only from disclosure, from other side. It's, a, it's a, an issue of modeling. At the end of the day, a lot of this stuff will be about modeling, you know, what the, uh, the trajectories are. And then and again, getting the providers of capital to continue to exert pressure uh, on those companies. And then the companies, which are the operating entities, to begin to transform you know, their, uh, their operations. Uh, both policy uh, makers and government, governments, policy makers, providers of capital, we can all push uh, the companies, but ultimately it is the companies in their operating activities that are the ones that need to execute on this. And, and the more we, uh, we put pressure on, on those companies, the better off we're gonna be. Um, at MSCI, we clearly wanna help in this process by providing data, models, indices, for example, for policy benchmarks, uh, not only to the providers of capital, but we're also entering new areas at MSCI, which, which is helping the companies themselves, which is not something that traditionally we have done, but it is in the spirit of trying to, uh, to be helpful to the process. It's not it just, it's not just go tell the companies, go do this, go do that. And the companies say, I don't know what to do. Who's gonna help me? Somebody has to be there, or different companies have to be there to help them achieve this tremendous transformation that they need to uh, effect. So those statistics are really interesting. And, and I think that the, um, you know, the 15%, a third that have targets and 15% have net zero. Um, how, how do you think about the net zero targets in terms of their ultimate impact on the planet? Because as you said, the investors are trying to put pressure on the companies to make decisions that lead to um, lower emissions. Um, net zero targets are, are one way to, of doing that. Um, I think the, the, the flip side of that, sometimes the criticism pushback is that um, for net zero targets, sometimes the easiest thing to do is just get things off your balance sheet, sell them to somebody else who doesn't have one, have a, have a net zero target. So how, do you think that net zero targets are um, a critical way for us to, to drive towards these kinds of numbers? Because an 8% reduction every year is, that, that's, that's a, you know, that, that's a big, that's a big reduction. Yeah, so it's, a, it's definitely a going to be a combination of tools. Uh, it starts with uh, data uh, that comes from disclosure and, and other, other sources of data. Without data, it's pretty hard to navigate you know, where we are. There are no measurement tools you know, without data. The second one is models. And the third one are targets uh, to, uh, to achieve uh, the objectives. So on the data part, uh, this is where uh, the policymakers initiatives on disclosures, mandatory and, uh, and uh, voluntary disclosures are pretty important. But having said that, there are always a lot of excuses by either companies or investors that because they don't have perfect information or semi-perfect information, they cannot get started. Well, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to know that you know an oil and gas company operating in certain parts of the world is going to emit a lot of uh, fossil, a lot of uh, you know carbon emissions. So, directionally, you know where to start. Now, you may not be able to measure it precisely, but you know where to start. So that's on the data and the disclosure side. Yes, we need a lot more, but the data that we currently have should be good enough to know the direction of travel. The second part, which is what you're asking, is the models. So uh, that lead to targets. Uh, so one model is to project out the emissions as to when you're gonna get to net zero. But there are a lot of different models that, for example, we at MSCI are using. For the providers of capital, we have models called uh, climate value at risk. 
which is you look at the physical and transition risk of your investments, and then uh, and through that process, depending on what degrees of warming you're looking at, and then you present value, uh, what is the effect on the portfolio, and that leads you to a different allocation of capital. So that would be for the providers of capital. For the users of capital, i.e. private and public companies, we have developed uh, uh, an implied temperature rise model uh, uh, with, uh, with a lot of feedback from uh, the, the CFD and also from uh, the COP26 uh, organization. And this model is entity by entity. What we do is we say, what is the trajectory of the current emission? What are the targets that they need to have? And then we translate that into a degree of warming. So we can say this company is a two and a half degree company. This company is a four degree company, meaning that you know, that company will, uh, will be living in a world of three or four degrees if they don't change the trajectory. So that, that is obviously uh, you know, a pretty favorite uh, of Mark Carney, for example, and, um, and, the, and the COP26. So that's gonna be another tool you know, to understand this. The net zero is the ultimate destination. Uh, and that's important to keep in mind uh, for sure, but we also have to work on what is the what are the data and what are the models that are going to help you in the trajectory, in the journey to that destination in, in order to uh, to achieve viability and sustainability. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and I think that the um, this projecting out the future, and as you said, trying to invest now for that future is. Um, one of the big challenges that investors um, today have, but one of the complaints that, that we hear from companies often is that um, the investors are not looking far enough out at this data, that they're sort of asking about, you know, today, now, this quarter, this year, and somebody else will worry about that later. Do you find that uh, the demand for this sort of projection is coming more from the investment side, from the company side, or who's who's you know who's driving this, or is it a little bit of each? Are we all sort of you know getting there together? Yeah, so I happen to be in that interesting position of uh, you know running a publicly traded company, <laughs> and therefore being subject to the same uh, obligations and demands of our own carbon footprint, you know, at the company. And what are we going to do about it? and hopefully trying to be an example uh, to others. Second one of, uh, as a company providing a lot of these tools to investors and, and to companies um, you know, in the world. And then thirdly, working with regulators and, and policy makers to, uh, to try to uh, guide them in, in the direction that, uh, that could be most helpful. So I think, you know, Sarah, you're, the answer is that, you know, as, a, as somebody running a public company, you're gonna get pressure from a lot of different sources. You're gonna get NGOs. You gotta get activists, uh, social activists, your environmental activists. You're gonna get uh, share, shareholder activists. You're gonna have uh, you know short-term shareholders like hedge funds. You're gonna have long-term shareholders and the like. And uh, and that pressure will intensify significantly in you know, over the years. And therefore, you know, just like running a public company, you know, uh, you need to say, okay, what do I need to do in the short term? You know, quarter by quarter but I gotta keep my eyes on the price of the longer term, you know, because uh, the longer term is gonna be made up of uh, a, a lot of different quarters or a lot of different years, you know, to get there. So, uh, so I think there are a number of CEOs that naturally and logically feel lost because uh, they're reacting to so many, you know, pressure points. I think that uh, my advice to them has always been, you know, bunker down, uh, try to eliminate a lot of the noise, Focus on what are your longer term objectives and what is the day to day, quarter to quarter, you know, year by year path to get there in a way that is not a hockey stick, in a way that you're going to be making a you know, promise all the time. And if you do that, you're going to do a number of things. Uh, you're going to be able to satisfy the long term investors. You're going to be able to uh, to satisfy the short term investors that you know may may want to uh, change management because they don't believe you're addressing the problem like we have seen in Exxon and Chevron and Shell and uh, and, and lastly and importantly uh, and most importantly is that your go your fiduciary duty is going to be fulfilled of preserving the long term sustainability and existence of, of your company 
Um, but there is a lot of noise. There is a lot of uh, a lot of pressure points, and they and that those are going to be you know very intense. And therefore, being able to navigate in that fog uh, with some clear eyes is is going to become more and more important for the leadership of uh, of these companies. Yeah, I think that this um, activism point you raise is so important. Obviously, we've seen the. Um, the Exxon case recently, the other ones that you've mentioned, you know, we like you have been trying to encourage companies to share a long-term roadmap of where they're going, um, incorporate climate into that, have real milestones along the way. Um, but we often see companies have a really hard time doing that, or either they don't want, they either they don't have a long-term strategy or they don't want to share a long-term strategy because they're afraid that they'll get um, boxed into that or that uh, somebody won't like that strategy. So how do you think about the, the role of both um, traditional shareholder activists, but also this sort of new kind of shareholder activist coming into this space? As you said, they're, they're buffeting uh, CEOs from, from both sides. Uh, how, do, how do you see that progressing as we go forward? Well, you know, I'm on our important clients at MSCI in getting uh, climate data, climate tools, our activists, uh, hedge funds, and other forms of activist investors. Because, uh, you know, in a free capitalistic uh, world, they see an opportunity to, uh, to go out and, and, and look at companies that are not addressing this problem, uh, that their cost of capital is getting higher. Uh, the, uh, the pricing of uh, their assets, including their common stock, uh, is um, is coming down or subdued, and they see a major opportunity to unlock value, you know, for them. That's going to be a, a, a field, a, a very fertile field for uh, for activism uh, in the uh, in in the quarters and years to come, um, because uh, you know because it's it's gonna it's gonna be even better than anything else that they have done. You know, to be honest with you. Uh, in terms of uh, opportunity, so um, so that's going to be that is already here uh, in some ways. It's going to increase dramatically, uh, and therefore the managers uh, of these companies and their board of directors need to wake up to uh, to that reality. Uh, the other thing that typically happens is that a lot of companies see this as a problem. They see this as a nuisance. They see this as an obstacle. Uh, especially the oil and gas companies, right? And, uh, and and the fact is, you know, when somebody is in the oil and gas business, they're in the energy business. They're not in the oil and gas business. So they are a big part of the solution to a lot of these problems. They have incredible expertise in energy, whether it's uh, fossil fuel energy or clean energy. So they should be viewing this as incredible opportunities for them to uh, reposition their companies and uh, and grow, you know, substantially and build a competitive moat and build competitive advantages, you know, and, and that can be said of a, a lot of other companies, you know, as well. There will be a large number of winners and a very large number of, of, uh, of losers in this whole scheme. As I said, in that reconstruction, in that complete reconstruction of the global economy in that time frame of 10 to 20 years, we're bound to have a lot of winners and a lot of losers. And the question is, what do you want to be? What camp do you want to be uh, at, at that point? And how fast are, are you uh, willing to move uh, and be prepared uh, to uh, to benefit from from that? So I think that uh, you know that that is that 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 is the direction of travel. And uh, and if you don't do that, it's not simply that people are going to leave you alone. It's the activists that are going to come and uh, and and kick you out uh, as a management team uh, or board and replace it with somebody who. Uh, who's going to unlock the value of the company. Yeah, I think that, you know, we've been thinking about um, a few years ago, some people would say, you know, they didn't have a sustainability strategy or that wasn't their problem or they didn't, you know, they weren't thinking about that much. You, you can't say that anymore. And um, it's, you know, it's a little bit if like somebody said 25 years ago, yeah, I don't really understand the internet. It's probably not going to have a big impact on my business. So, you know, I'm not really going to worry about it too much. So um, that, that, didn't end, that didn't end well. Um, so I, I think that this uh, company is really focusing on what they can do. And it's hard. I mean, we know that it's, it's very hard to transition a business and, and to be in a transitioning um, world. Um, but that's sort of the world. That's sort of the world we're in. Yep. 
And actually, Sarah, I think that, uh, you know, we clearly, uh, given our roles uh, at uh, FCLT and at MSCI, you know, we, uh, we focus on uh, companies, you know, public, private, and we focus on their, their shareholders, you know, their providers of capital. Um, uh, but uh, all of society, every single organization uh, in the world needs to uh, move in this direction, whether it's households, you know, so uh, uh, I, for one, is, you know, have spent a little bit of, of time with my children to say, okay, how are we going to decarbonize our house? You know, uh, should we, what kind of solar panels should we install? What kind of uh, cleaner energy should we use? Uh, you know, and when do we do that, et cetera. So that will be, um, you know, an, an example of a household. Then you have universities, you know, universities uh, that run big, the universities are very large enterprises. So how are you going to decarbonize what you do? You know, then you have, you know, governments and municipalities. You have obviously private companies, you have public companies. So everyone has to move in that direction. So if you go back and look at what I said, 21% of the total emissions are publicly listed companies. You know, uh, so where is that other 79% coming from, right? You know, that's a big, big number. Uh, if anything, I was a little bit surprised as to how low the listed companies' emissions were compared. And by the way, these are uh, scope one emissions, you know, not scope two or scope three. So that's the definition of that 11 billion metric tons or 21%. Um, so obviously, when we measure the uh, scope two and the scope three, that's going to, you know, significantly increase. But I think, you know, in society, you know, this is a problem for everyone. And therefore, what are we going to do? So it's a wake up call for religious institutions or universities or municipalities or uh, public and private companies, you know, governments, et cetera, everyone. We cannot simply be pointing fingers to others. We have to say, what are we going to do? Uh, in, in my case, for example, what am I going to do in my home? What am I going to do as a as the CEO of MSCI Inc.? You know, not only is to point, you know, problems to others, but what are we going to do ourselves? So I think it's a, it's a massive effort and uh, the world is beginning to wake up. I think 2021 is going to be a milestone year because of COP26, uh, obviously, because of the Biden administration uh, taking uh, hold of this problem uh, and trying to recapture sort of lost ground. Uh, and, and the like. So I think that uh, we're beginning to see, obviously, the uh, the physical risk, you know, with the wildfires and hurricanes and tornadoes and and the like, and the effect of that. So uh, you know, you know, the different temperature changes that have happened in California and in, in the northwest of the U.S. and the East Coast, we're beginning to see this cl clearly, and and uh, the world is now well prepared, and therefore, uh, you know, we we very much. Uh, you know, salute you and praise you for your voice uh, and, and your organization's uh, efforts to try to mobilize the providers of capital and the users of capital. I've been privileged to have attended some of the sessions that you have set up. And all of us have to speak very loudly and very outspokenly and, uh, on this uh, issue so that we can get uh, the world moving in the right direction. Well, I, I I I couldn't agree more. It's so uh, it, you know the, the time the time is now. You know, one thing you just mentioned you mentioned you know the 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 west of the United States and other places. Obviously, you know Australia and lots of places have had fires and um, all sorts of extreme weather events. MSCI is a very global company. Um, how do you see this conversation um, evolving around the world? Do you think that there's um, a, a strong agreement of, uh, among the many countries that you um, operate in uh, about the nature of this, or do you see a real range of views? Are we are we pulling together, or are we are we um, are we more disparate? Well, uh, I'm glad you asked that question because that's an extremely important question. Uh, I think what you see at a minimum is uh, three different perspectives. There is the um, the American perspective, uh, European one, and then the emerging markets. The, uh, the American perspective to, uh, to solve this problem is, uh, is an extreme faith on technology, that uh, it is this technology that is gonna get us out of the problem and therefore we need to mobilize the American economy to uh, incentivize you know, green uh, technology, green infrastructure, you know, renewable energy to lead to a, a cleaner energy world. 
the European perspective is, is a little bit of that, obviously, but more importantly is, no, you cannot escape. Uh, you got you, you, you to gotta go on a diet here, right? You got to start you know, eliminating emissions and immediately. So there is a little more focus on, on, on that. And then the emerging markets, uh, you know, China, India, and Brazil, and others, their perspective is to say, it's good for you developed markets to, uh, to talk about this because you already industrialized, you already have prosperous societies, but we need to get a break uh, you know, in order to keep industrializing and therefore carbonizing the world. And therefore uh, you need to make up for that. So, uh, so I think that is, uh, that's a big debate going on. I think the brilliance of the Paris Agreement was that instead of focusing on getting a fixed uh, a, a fixed reduction in the carbon emission and then trying to fight it all out among the countries as to who is gonna uh, who is gonna reduce what, which would have been a complete disaster. I think the French leadership of uh, the Paris Agreement were, were very brilliant about saying we're not gonna achieve anything doing that. What we're gonna do is set is voluntary emissions and then we're gonna have the world compete on who is doing more voluntary. Uh, uh, emission reductions. So you now see that happening. For example, when uh, when President Biden met uh, with the president of Korea a, a month or so ago, they talked about two big things. They talked about North Korea, and then they talked about what each of them was going to pledge, you know, in terms of the new uh, or renewed uh, uh, reduction uh, in uh, in COP26 in November. And uh, when the president of Korea said, my goal is the following, President Biden said, can you do better than that? You know, we're allies, we need to work hard here. So I think that if we get lucky in the world, there will be a competition to win the hearts of societies uh, and uh, in, in terms of countries and governments saying, let's, let's start a competition, voluntary competition, who is going to do the best and then shame the other ones that are not doing it. I think that's the that's the passageway that's more important, creating this zero sum game of having to split up the uh, the, the numbers and fighting it out is doesn't look like it's going to be a, a very productive uh, path. So that's that. Now, obviously, there are a number of countries, you know, like India, for example, and China that say that's where a lot of the carbon, uh, the coal emission, you know, is coming from. And they say, well, we got, we need time. We need, uh, you know, a transition uh, and the like. So uh, they're looking for, for a lot of breaks and maybe they will get some breaks by the developed markets. But, but having said that, this is not a question of pushing the blame to somebody else. This is a question that, you know, 30, 40 years from now, we'll either have a, a planet that is sustainable or a planet that will die and our, our generations, um, our children's generations, uh, and, the, and, the, and the following ones are gonna you know, have to live with those consequences. I don't think that's something we wanna inherit to them. Right? No, that's right. And I love the, the competition mindset because I do think that, um, that it, that's much more, uh, perhaps it's more capitalistic in some ways than the, um, the, than the you know, divide up the, divide up the pie mindset. So last question that I really want to come back to you on is, you know, this is a 10 or 20 or whatever, however many year issue, many investment fiduciaries actually have that kind of time frame. You know, a pension plan typically has liabilities that last, you know, 10, 20, 30 years, sovereign wealth funds typically are for the next generation, whatever it may be. So, you know, you have a long-term problem and you've got a lot of long-term investors out there. Um, some of those long-term investors are taking the net zero approach and thinking about it that way. Others are thinking about it in other ways. If you had you know, advice to give to the long-term investor, this, the, the person who wants to do their fiduciary duty um, and think about how they fulfill that fiduciary duty over the next, you know, not quarter or year, but decade or two, um, uh, what, what kind of advice do you give the, 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 the long-term investor? Well, Sarah, first of all, uh, uh, the, this is probably one of the few times in which, in which a little bit of uh, short-termism 
may end up being good for the world. Uh, very, very few instances. And the reason is it, what I said at the beginning, uh, I don't think this is a long-term you know, investment problem. I think this is a short to medium-term investment problem. So if any, you know, if any investor is thinking that this is a problem they're going to face 10 years from now, 20 years from now, start facing it, you know, 10, 20 years from now. I think they're going to wake up to a rude, uh, to a very rude, uh, you know, awakening because, uh, I, the, you know, we have about 8,000 investment institutional clients in some 90 countries in the world. And uh, what I can tell you is that the leading institutional investors, the leading investment managers, the leading banks in the last 12, 24 months have started not only to analyze this problem, but to move capital you know, in this direction, to reallocate capital, to take defensive postures. Now, that's not you know, the majority of the capital of the world, but these are the leading entities and therefore others will follow soon. So in the same way that you notice that in the last 12, 8, 12 14 months, ESG, in general, not climate, but ESG in general, has had a repricing and reallocation of capital. You know, I think that that is a pathway, that is an example of what's gonna happen to climate. You know, the, the, the reallocation of capital and the repricing of assets is gonna happen, it was gonna start happening much sooner than people think. So this is, you know, climate risk is investment risk as, as, as BlackRock will say, right? Uh, and therefore, this is here, and you got to deal with it now because it's going to affect your portfolios in the next few quarters, few years. Uh, obviously, it's going to affect it even more so, you know, 10 years from now. So that's one, one point that I will make. The second point is that, you know, obviously, even if you look at it as a longer term issue, you know, as a fiduciary, um, you got to start acting now because, you know, these are massive changes to a portfolio. So if you have, uh, for example, uh, you know, if you're a university endowment and have 50% in private assets, you know how hard it is to reallocate assets from private assets to other, uh, other managers. That takes you years and years, maybe even a decade. So, uh, so that's something that you will need to work hard today in order to uh, have some meaningful effect. You know, this is not like within a quarter or two, you can reallocate the entire portfolio. The other one is, you know, I, I normally don't recommend to anybody that uh, given their fiduciary duty that they should be giving up any returns. This is about, you know, creating alpha and it is about avoiding risk. So there is a little bit of a, of a, of a myth that if you want to be uh, invested in, in ESG or, or in climate change, you know, you're going to be, be giving up returns, either mid short term, mid term, or long term returns. That is not the case. There is a complete body of evidence that you could uh, improve your returns uh, uh, if you act, uh, you know, immediately and, and in the right direction. And, and that, that improvement of returns and reduction of risk is going to increase significantly. That divergence is going to increase significantly. Uh, and the like. So yes, this is a, what is perceived to be a longer term problem because 20, 50, 30 years from now looks like a long time from now. Uh, but in fact, this is, uh, this is gonna be uh, front loaded. Uh, and therefore uh, you, you have those two issues. You gotta think about the longer term and, you know, and passing on that, you know, those assets to future generations, whether it's an endowment or a pension fund uh, or, or other pool of assets that's over wealth fund. But having said that, you know, this is a lot more front loaded that people are, are, are realizing. Yeah, the the uh, the time is now because markets don't wait. Um, and I think that's a um, that that that's actually a, a very good lesson that many of us have learned, um, you know, over time in the markets. And, and your point on ESG is is well taken. There's been a huge repricing, a real understanding that 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 there, there is both alpha and risk reduction to be made by thinking about many of these issues. And, and, and I think that, I do think that that is becoming well accepted. So partly because of the work that MSCI has done. So we, we really, we thank you for that. Thank you for your time the, today. Thank you for your support and your tough questions and all of those things of FCLT Global. We really, we really appreciate that. So thank you very much for, for joining me on the, on the podcast today. A pleasure. 
Thanks for listening to today's episode of Going Long with FCLT Global. Be sure to hit subscribe to get new episodes every other Monday. To learn more, visit our website at fcltglobal.org.